Good evening and welcome. I'm Brendan King. I'm an Upper Arlington resident, a city council member, and I currently have the distinct privilege and honor to serve as the president of the Upper Arlington Historical Society Board. On behalf of the Historical Society, this is the first event in our second History Speaks series. More information about future events can be found on page two and three of your program. As we kick off tonight's event, a special thanks uh, needs to be shared with our lead sponsor, First Merchants Bank, and our two supporting sponsors, the Wellington School and the Veterans Committee, whose generous support make this evening and future events possible. Please join me in sharing our thanks to those three sponsors. Before I introduce our speaker, I've got a few rules to share. The first, uh, very 2022, please silence your cell phones. Uh, also, please take a minute to look around and find the nearest exit. And then it's worth mentioning that we're videotaping tonight's event, so it will be available for those of you who want to share it after Anne speaks. Our community is expressing a strong interest in pre-Upper Arlington history. What and who was here before we first became a village and then a city? The History Speaks series reflects this curiosity, and we begin tonight by transporting back to the first half of the 19th century in Southern Ohio. We're honored to have our guest speaker, Anne Hagedorn, to lead us through her well-researched stories of real people's lives in the great social movement known as the Underground Railroad. Anne is a former staff writer for the Wall Street Journal and an award-winning author of five previous narrative nonfiction books. As an adjunct professor, she has taught writing at Columbia University, Northwestern, Xavier, and Miami University. She's earned master's degrees from Columbia University and the University of Michigan, and an honorary degree in humane letters from Denison University, which is her undergraduate alma mater where she majored in history. Her quest as a narrative nonfiction writer is to seek the truth about topics significant to the American public. Then, using facts unearthed from thorough research to engage the writers, or readers rather, through a, the art of storytelling. And if you ask her her philosophy as a writer and teacher, she will quote African-American poet Maya Angelou, when you learn, teach, when you get, give. Please join me in welcoming Anne Hagedorn. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Very honored to be here. What a wonderful place. And I've been working with uh, people uh, who have been absolutely excellent in planning this. I'm so honored to be here. And uh, as soon as I find my glasses, I'll be able to uh, give you hopefully a really good presentation. So uh, anyhow, uh, here we go. <coughs> So uh, tonight, what I plan to do is to talk a little bit uh, about uh, what happened here in Ohio in the antebellum years in that social movement we now refer to often as the Underground Railroad, and, <clears throat> and then do a few readings from uh, beyond the river. And uh, this book, it was my third book, and, uh, and so it, it went, uh, I wrote it in 1999, 2000, 2001, and uh, completed it in 2002. So for the purposes of tonight, I reread it. <laughs> I reread my own book because I thought I must do a, an excellent presentation for these people. And, uh, and it was quite an experience. I highly recommend, out, out of that experience, I have reread books. I have made a list of my 20 favorite books of all time, and I'm going to reread all of them. Um, <clears throat> but at any rate, so here we go. So 
On New Year's Eve in 1821, a gentleman whom many of you know by name, Reverend John Rankin, arrived on the banks of the Ohio River on the Kentucky side with his wife, Jean, three sons and one daughter, completing a journey three of them had begun from Tennessee in 1817, the journey to a free state. That night, the river was running with ice flows, and the flatboat the Rankins had arranged to use for the crossing was far too large. Only small skiffs could dodge the flows, but the Rankins had to depart as quickly as possible because the ice had fused. Leaving their horses and possessions with friends, they boarded two skiffs, and soon, in the early hours of January 1st, 1822, they pulled the skiffs onto the riverbank at Ripley, Ohio. <clears throat> that was 200 years ago, a time when the shores of the Ohio River were home to slavery's two cultures of resistance and oppression, colliding often like sheets of ice, grinding one against the other. <clears throat> By then, the Reverend John Rankin had become a passionate orator and writer, a fearless activist, and a well-known name. For slave traders, catchers, and owners, his name was synonymous with trouble. For slaves, for slaves and abolitionists, he was already renowned for sending messages of hope and plans for freedom. This was a man who would soon, in 1824, write a letter to his brother Thomas saying, quote, even after a people who have been long enslaved are emancipated, it will require them to pass through several generations in order to regain their original strength of mind and to give the world a fair exhibition of the great powers they really possess. 200 years ago. It was indeed two years after his arrival in Ripley that Rankin received a letter from Thomas, who lived at that time in Virginia, with an update including the news of Thomas's recent purchase of slaves. Rankin was appalled by that and decided to respond with several letters that would unleash his hatred for and despair over the human bondage he was trying to bring down. In the first letter, in 1824, he described slavery as, quote, a never-failing fountain of the grossest immorality and one of the deepest sources of human misery. It hangs like a mantle of night over our republic and shrouds its rising glories, unquote. In the next letter, he wrote this, quote, at the basis of slavery is racial prejudice, but at the basis of that is the love of gain, which is the polluted fountain whence issue all the dreadful evils that pervade our world, unquote. The letters were first published in an anti-slavery newspaper called The Castigator, which was produced in Ripley. And the last letter appeared in the February 22nd, 1825 edition. In 1826, the owner of the Castigator published the letters in book form. And the following year, Rankin's brother came to Ripley with his slaves and freed them. In 1830, the letters were printed in a new book by a New Jersey publisher, an edition that saw many printings and was widely dispersed, even to England and its second edition found its way to William Lloyd Garrison, the soon-to-be-famous abolitionist in Boston. Garrison serialized the letters in 1832 in his new anti-slavery newspaper called The Liberator. And later, at an anti-slavery convention, Garrison would quote from the letters and refer to Rankin as, quote, my anti-slavery father, his book on slavery was the cause of my entering the anti-slavery conflict, unquote. Later, when Garrison gave a copy of his autobiography to Rankin, he inscribed it like this, <clears throat> quote, to Reverend John Rankin, with the profound regards and loving veneration of his anti-slavery disciple and humble co-worker in the cause of emancipation. Sincerely, 
Garrison, unquote. In the 1838 edition of the Book of Letters, the fifth edition, Rankin wrote a preface that closed like this, quote, let all friends of justice do what they can in their several circles and according to their various stations, capacities, and opportunities. And all their little streams of exertion will, in the process of time, flow together and constitute a mighty river that shall sweep away the yoke of human oppression and purge our nation from the abominations of slavery." Unquote. Rankin's words and his passion did indeed reach many people. So did the network he began to organize shortly after his arrival in Ripley, a network of remarkable men and women, black and white, who would soon cause Ripley to be known among pro-slavery advocates as the abolitionist hellhole. Excuse me. The network included John Parker, a former slave who was an inventor, an owner of a foundry, and an ardent abolitionist. Thomas McCaig, a banker who was also the owner of a very successful pork packing enterprise <clears throat> based in Ripley and doing trade with the South. A local tavern owner and minister, John Bennington Mahan. <clears throat> the carpenter, Thomas Collins, who made coffins and the wagons to carry them, some having space between the coffin and the bottom of the wagon to transport a living human. And there were the women, the women. Someday I always say I'm going to write a book called The Abolitionist's Wife <laughs> and tell the story of Jean Rankin or Catherine McCaig or, or one of them. Excuse me, I need to... Um, and then there were the women, Jean Rankin, uh, known as a stalwart member of the network and a sharpshooter. <clears throat> she was uh, quite, uh, she had five shotguns and all different, and uh, there was uh, a story about her, how she could uh, 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 knock off a rabbit uh, across in northern Kentucky across the river from high on the hill in Ripley. So she was uh, quite an individual. Catherine uh, Kitty McCaig, who insisted on sheltering slaves during the day as well as at night in the McCaig's home on Front Street on the river. The heroic free black woman, Sally Hudson, and visitors such as Harriet Beecher Stowe, who knew John Rankin and one of his sons who was studying at the Lane Seminary um, in Cincinnati, which her father Lyman ran and her husband Calvin Stowe, uh, where he taught, and who sometimes attended network meetings in Ripley, one documented at the McCaig's house. These were, of course, early players in what would someday be widely known as the Underground Railroad, a name that always prompts images of tunnels, hidden rooms, secret passages to attics, etc. But delving deeply into the world of Ripley's network reveals more than architectural intrigue. It glows with moral brilliance and astute planning. For example, the properties along the alleys that run perpendicular to the river were purchased by participants in the network, and so was the land between Rankin's farm at the top of the hill that overlooks Ripley and the next way station at Red Oak Creek. There was a feature that, that was a feature that helped achieve the goal of guiding the escaping men, women, and children as quickly and as far away as possible from the Ohio River up to Canada. Not an easy goal to achieve, as noted many times in the anti-slavery newspapers of the era. For example, I found this quote in an 1838 issue of The Philanthropist, a newspaper first published in New Richmond, Ohio, and then by April of 1836, it was being published in uh, Cincinnati. Quote, when was Ohio free? 
Never. It is a mere race ground between the slave states in Canada, between the land of violence and oppression and the land of liberty. And all its highways and byways are so many courses, entered and scoured and run over by slaveholders and their hirelings. Beyond the Ohio River, there was Ripley. And beyond Ripley, there were many way stations and safe houses, several hundred throughout the state of Ohio, up to the Canadian border. What a stunning legacy. This was a network of individuals who so believed human bondage was wrong that they were willing to take immense risks for themselves and their families. It was about more than compassion or intellectual beliefs. It was about action. They were more than abolitionists who stood up and spoke out about what they believed in. They were gatekeepers who often faced a shivering, possibly starving stranger standing at their door and then provided shelter and food. This was not idle compassion. In fact, we should all, after tonight's event, we should all do a toast uh, to the many Ohioans who did indeed risk their lives and their livelihoods to assist fugitive slaves. Exemplary men and women proving for future generations that blacks and whites can work together for the greater good by trusting each other. And trust is one of the key words in this saga. In fact, the only other title I ever thought of for the book Beyond the River was Trust. I wanted to call the book Trust uh, <clears throat> because it was all about trust. And if it's ever made into a film or a limited series, I think I'm going to ask them to call it Trust, <laughs> you know? Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, it was all about trust. Think about it. Who to trust? How could a slave trust anyone beyond his or her circle, and especially someone who was white? Think about it. Um, and with all the propaganda and lies about slaves, how could someone bring such a stranger into their homes at 3 a.m.? Trust. And it obviously wasn't easy for anyone, especially because deception in, those, in that particular antebellum period, um, it was as common as daily bread. For example, in the book, there is the John Bennington Mahan story. Uh, a man who appeared to be a fugitive slave came to John Mahan's tavern seeking help and actually being forced to do so by his Kentucky owner who devised the scheme to catch Mahan in the act of stealing what the owner claimed was his property, his slave, and then abducting Mahan, taking him to uh, Kentucky, throwing him in jail, and forcing him to stand trial for stealing the so-called property. With time, trust became more and more of an issue. As the book notes, by the early 1850s, there was a bourgeoning uh, industry of con artists who told slaves they were part of the Underground Railroad, part of the Underground Movement, and then turned them in for a reward. Near Ripley, just over the line into Adams County, for example, a scoundrel by the name of Fountain Pemberton was in the habit of searching the local papers for notices of cash rewards for runaways and then hunting them down. He had been able to buy a house and a small parcel of land with the proceeds from his betrayals. The Ripley narrative does brim with stories that bring alive the power, the necessity, and the courage of trust. Indeed, there are many lessons uh, to be learned from what happened in Ohio, uh, revelations that poke through the sinister curtain of racism, stories and players who bring alive important points, such as the fact that racial barriers can begin to collapse, myths can be smashed, apathy can end when people come face to face with the impact of racism. A memorable example in the Rankin family is a story about uh, Rankin's oldest son, who was on that skiff um, on the morning of uh, 200 years ago, Adam Laurie Rankin, and his sudden realization about what his father was trying to accomplish in the endless crusade to abolish slavery. It's a fabulous father-son story, because if uh, I found a lot of the diaries of Adam Laurie Rankin, 
and one very long one actually at Stanford University in the archives there. And he went into great detail about how he so resented that his father would force him up at two o'clock in the morning to saddle up a horse and take a fugitive slave to the next way station. <clears throat> But Adam was studying to be a carpenter, and he was specializing in the building of steamboats. In December 1834, while he was working on the intricate molding of a steamship cabin, he was told that a very large steamship heading to the south had docked at Ripley, and that he and his fellow apprentices could be given a tour. While on the tour, he wandered to the lower deck, where he saw two groups of slaves, about 50 in all, chained to each side of the vessel, the men on the left and women on the right. It was something he would never forget, later writing at great length about the experience and the awakening. Quote, the men were so sullen, and the women appeared to be stricken with a hopeless grief. Unquote. From then on, he began to engage in another type of apprenticeship, a very secretive apprenticeship, working with his father and the members of the Ripley Underground Network. For many years, I've felt that writing is my calling. But with this book, the dedication moved to an even deeper level. Uh, beyond the adventure of the Underground Railroad and the secrets and the intrigue, which is uh, seemingly endless, and as many of you out there know, because you've done research in your own uh, communities, um, <clears throat> it is the unforgettable story of the anti-slavery teamwork throughout Ohio in those antebellum years that uh, once you find out about it, once you dig into it, it's something that stays with you. You can't forget. And perhaps the greatest significance of what happened in Ohio's network, from the Ohio River all the way to Canada, is that it shows what determination and devotion to something larger than ourselves looks like. These selfless people and their risks, it would seem, should be models for upcoming generations always. To be sure, Ohio's early heroes of the Underground Railroad, their bravery, their bonds in a network that saved countless lives, their trust moves us closer to the level of humanity that we must all strive for. And that was the lure of the story for me that became the book Beyond the River. As a quick aside, uh, I have to say how I discovered the topic because it's a question so often asked of authors. And it, it happened during the holidays in <clears throat> 1998, a long time ago, uh, when I was visiting my mother in Ohio, coming in from New York City right before teaching a writing course at Columbia for the spring semester. And one afternoon, I drove to Dayton to Oakwood, to a public library where, as a child, I had learned about the excitement of reading, the right public library. I wanted to do some research. I uh, wanted to see what books uh, the library might have regarding black history in Ohio, and in Dayton in particular, for the backdrop of a novel uh, that I had been sketching out, and still am. <laughs> been sticking with nonfiction for a long time. Anyhow, that's a novel yet to come. Okay. Um, when it began to snow, I started to leave uh, to beat any accumulation. Uh, there are some people in this audience who knew my mother, and it was my mother's car I was driving. So my mother uh, wanted that car back quickly, and her daughter, who hadn't owned a car for 20 years of living in New York, uh, made it even more important to get the car back to her that day. So I thought I'd better beat the ac snow accumulation, but something tugged at me. Just as I was leaving the building, a tug to return and to just wait it out. So I did decide to wait out the snow and to complete what I had started, which was looking through books in the library's collection on black history. Then after returning to that my table in the little corner, 
in the library, the first book I took off the shelf was an 1880 dissertation from Western Reserve University about black history in Ohio. And in it was a short section about Ripley, which I had never known about, and it even mentioned John Rankin, during, all during the antebellum years, of course. When I returned to New York, I began spending Saturday afternoons at the New York Public Library, continuing my exploration. What lured me was the excitement of discovering that what had happened early on in the Midwest, in Ohio, in the vicinity of the Ohio River Valley, had set the stage for the East Coast anti-slavery activism later. The part that many of us had learned about in history books, right? What happened next was that in February, I had that, the, that year that I was teaching at Columbia, I had uh, lunch with my literary agent, Alice Martell, uh, to discuss book ideas. We always have these luncheons, discuss book ideas. An occasion perhaps best described in the acknowledgments of the book, uh, rediscovered while I was putting this together, and uh, certainly gives you a view of the writing life, I suppose, but also uh, how this book came to be, thanks to this wonderfully sensitive uh, and bright literary agent. I was excited about two ideas I had developed, and as I eagerly described them, I watched Alice's face, waiting for that look of excitement that I knew so well, and hoping for the praise that I was certain one of the ideas would inspire. But the praise never came, and her facial muscles seemed to sink into sullenness, while the piece of grilled salmon on her fork fell to her plate, unnoticed. <laughs> then she took a deep breath, regained her usual composure, and asked simply, what is in your heart? I said, I can't stop thinking about the Underground Railroad. I can't stop thinking about these people that, whom I've discovered recently, these people who dedicated their lives to something larger than themselves. The Ohio Valley is especially intriguing to me, but I haven't thought of it as a book, really. Then that look that every author hopes for, <laughs> the smile, the eyes bright again, um, dessert coming, you know. <laughs> yes, she said, that is your book. And my response at first was, uh, no, she said, yes, that is your book. You are going to tell the world what happened along the Ohio River during the antebellum years, the anti-slavery movement that laid, whoops, the groundwork for what happened out here, meaning the East Coast. I said, no, I'm a journalist. I, I don't have a PhD in history. And she said, yes, you're a journalist, and you'll use that skill set to research and write the story. To save it, you have to save it. Uh, so we discussed it further about how such a book could show how the people living on the moral fault line of slavery, that being the Ohio River, made their decisions, how they survived the stresses of hearing the sounds of slavery on the other side of the river. As Alice said, this was an undeclared war, a war before the war. You must do it. So thank you, Alice. <laughs> I must say that I am a writer who is somewhat uh, uneasy about the now required skill of all writers to promote their books. I just had a conversation before the event with someone about that. You know, the age of clones, I will welcome. You know, send the clone on the road while, you know, the introverted, humble author sits in the corner and writes the next book. But I, I, I dare say I may not live long enough for the age of clones. So uh, I'm very happy to be here, by the way. Okay. <laughs> no offense. Yeah. Yeah. But... Um, but to boast a bit about the saga depicted in Beyond the River is something I am comfortable doing. For it is a narrative about morally brilliant and astute individuals, people whose courage made such a difference in the lives of countless numbers of slaves in America. So uh, I'm going to close this presentation. I don't know how long it has lasted, but uh, I'm going, if there's time left, I'm going to close it with some readings. Kristen suggested some readings from the book. And I have to say that one of my Wall Street Journal editors 
always told us, never fall in love with your own writing, you know. And he was right about the value of humility, and I firmly believe that excellence nurtures humility. However, I do like the following readings. <laughs> Sorry, Don, you know, my wonderful, I love that editor. But yeah. Not so much because I wrote them, but because they have lingered for a long while in my soul. So I'll do a few readings. Let me have a little water first. Uh, and do just a few readings that give you a sense of <coughs> the book. Okay, so uh, this is the first paragraph. Uh, the preface, A Double Life. The people live, who lived on Front Street were the first to notice changes on the river. They knew when calm water began to churn, lapping loudly against the shore, or when boats stalled on shallow bends as rains of warmer days turned to snow and water levels fell. And in the middle of the wintry night, when sheets of ice slid down river, they could hear the high-pitched moan that some would say was the gradual grinding of the ice as flows collided and congealed. Others would swear it was the sound of a human cry. For as everyone in the town of Ripley knew, especially those who lived closest to the water, on Front Street, things happened in the night when the river froze, things that some townsfolk tried hard to expose, and others risked their lives to conceal. Okay, so then we come to, that's the uh, very first, that's the preface. Okay, then we come to chapter 14, Waves Break on uh, Either Shore. <clears throat> On a, blustery, on a blustery night in late February 1838, somewhere across the river from Ripley, the ice was breaking under the weight of an animal's body. Or was it the body of a human? The man standing on the banks of the Ohio side near the mouth of Red Oak Creek wasn't exactly sure what was causing the sounds he heard. His gun at his side, his ears primed to every discernible sound, his body wrapped in several coats to brace against the chill of the river winds, Chauncey Shaw had roamed these banks nearly every night since the river froze on February 22nd, waiting, hoping, and listening for the sounds he was now hearing, the telltale sounds of the struggle of a slave escaping across the river. Slave catchers like Shaw knew that when the river froze, the temptation for slaves to cross the icy road to freedom was sometimes too great to resist. Like the buzzards crisscrossing the sky above the river, the manhunters scouted the banks at night, watching the spots where skiffs had landed runaway slaves in the past and waiting, waiting, waiting. Skilled in the treachery of slave catching, Shaw was confident that patience would be rewarded up to $500 for a fugitive slave captured on the Ohio side. But on this night, the ice had begun to thaw. He knew the odds were slim that his waiting would earn him any reward. Quote, all the boys in town had been down on the slow ice that very afternoon. They knew the ice was rotten with air holes and cracks extending almost across the river, unquote, from John Rankin Jr.'s diary of that night. What slave would be desperate enough to try to cross on a night like this? Still, the cracking and splashing echoed back and forth against the snow-encrusted hills of both shores, and the sounds grew louder. Then came the baying of the hounds, the voices of men in pursuit, the desperate crying out of a woman. This was it, Shaw knew, the long-awaited catch. His pace quickened to nearly a run as he moved along the bank, tracking the sounds in an effort to target the exact place the slave might land. Crossing the river from the other shore was a slave woman who belonged to a farmer a few miles south of Dover, Kentucky, on the river, just five or so miles from Ripley. 
She had fled upon learning that a slave dealer had been meeting with her master about the sale of his slaves, including her two-year-old child. From that moment, freedom seemed as necessary as drawing breath. There was no going back. Okay. Okay, so then we will move on to uh, chapter 16. And... Um, and a uh, quick para introductory paragraph here. And this is actually the pref of the uh, sort of pre-scene of William Greathouse, the slave owner, coming and trapping um, Reverend uh, John Bennington Mayhem. The summer of 1838 was hotter than usual in the towns on the Ripley Line, especially inland from the river. On weekends, families flocked to the shores of the river where temperatures were a few degrees cooler. Children crowded the sandbars, splashing and screaming as they escaped from the wretched air into the lukewarm water. Ladies conversed over the fluttering of their fans in parlors darkened by shades and drapes pulled tightly closed to shut out the sun. Porch sitters swatted mosquitoes and horses flicked flies with their tails. Days were longer than nights, though little was accomplished since the pace of life was so slow that even the box turtles moving through gardens and across roads seemed to move faster than most people. The horsemen who came over from Kentucky seemed all the more conspicuous that summer as they frantically ran their horses with coats matted down in sweat and hooves sending up clouds of dust through the quiet sluggish town into the hills where they gathered posses of like-minded men and hunted humans as if they were deer. Okay. And then I'm going to close with, uh, with one of these, uh, with actually the last paragraph of the book because this... Uh, uh, this was actually a fabulous research experience. Uh, this story came from uh, a notebook that was found at the bottom of a box uh, that was given to the public library in Ripley. And sorting through it, I found this and uh, was just absolutely amazed uh, because I knew that Dr. Isaac Beck, about whom uh, this is, uh, um, I knew that he was part of Rankin's network. One day in the summer of 1892, just after sunset, Dr. Isaac Beck heard that rapping at the door that was once a common sound in his household. Standing on Beck's porch was a gray-haired black man who said he was traveling through Ohio to solicit funds for the benefit of a freedman's college near Memphis, Tennessee. He was a college professor, and he was a former fugitive slave. As he was coming through Brown County, he decided that he must take the time out from his work to find the people who had helped him escape <clears throat> many years before. Most of them, he learned, had already passed away. He remembered that Dr. Beck was one of the, one of the people who had carried food to him while he was hiding in a field outside of Sardinia. It had been 50 years, he said, but he could still recall the meal. He told Beck he had gone all the way to Canada, and then later, some years after the war, had returned to Tennessee to raise his family. Beck was touched that the man would seek him out, but as the man was about to leave, he realized that all through the conversation, he had never asked the man his name, nor had the man offered it. Sir, what is your name? asked Isaac Beck as he shook the man's hand at the door. The man smiled and said, my name is Rankin, after the man who took me in my first night there. To this day, I can't read that last line without getting teary-eyed, sorry. <laughs> oh, that is really amazing. I thought I had conquered that by now, but at any rate, let me try it one more time. The man smiled and said, my name is Rankin, after the man who took me in my first night here, unquote. So that, uh, dear audience, is my presentation tonight. And I want to thank all of you for coming here. This is a wonderful middle school. And 
uh, Upper Arlington Historical Society and all of the historical societies in the state of Ohio and all along the Ohio River um, are magnificent organizations that we should all um, be very supportive of. And I, I'm not going to pass the hat and ask for donations, by the way. <laughs> Kristen didn't tell me to say that. <laughs> no one did. It just, I wanted to thank you all for coming. And I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. And quite frankly, I am amazed that I can't read the last line of my book that I wrote <laughs> 20 years ago without getting teary-eyed. So I totally apologize. It is a very moving saga. Uh, and we're all very lucky to have Ohio. Oh, thank you very much. Whew. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Okay, so let's see what we have here. You can leave things there if you want. Okay, well, there might be done. something, yeah, in a question or something. So another, another round of applause for Anne. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. My name is Kristen Greenberg, and I'm the executive director of the Upper Arlington Historical Society. So thanks for the plug, Anne. Appreciate that. <laughs> we are delighted now to move to the Q&A portion of our evening. And I'd like to introduce our moderator for that, um, Erin Cornett from the Wellington School. Yes, we can do a pre-applause. Pre she deserves it. Um, as you know, the Wellington School is one of our supporting sponsors, so we are very thankful for that. Erin um, is currently a history teacher at Wellington. She entered kindergarten there, actually. She's also a grad. She entered kindergarten the very first year Wellington opened in 1982. Wellington is um, in Upper Arlington, and it is the first co-educational K-12 school um, private in Columbus. Um, she went on to Ohio State for her bachelor's in history and political science, and then on to Otterbein for her master's in education. She's been teaching 21 years at Wellington in a whole variety of courses from the standard US government and advanced economics to the unusual. My favorite of her new classes now um, is entitled Unpacking the F Word, and that would be feminism for all of you. <laughs> Um, so this Golden Apple Award winner is truly passionate about how you tell a story and why that story is important to tell. She has some of her own threads to pull with Anne, as well as the questions that some of you submitted. So let's welcome Anne and Erin. Thank you. She said we didn't have to do anything. Anne, thank you so much. It's been such a, it's an honor to be here. And it's, it's been so nice talking with you and, and getting to know you and this book because I'm in awe of how you pull something together like that as it's a detective, it's journalism, but then it's really telling the story. So as someone who's passionate about history and a passionate about teaching and telling the stories of history, it's, it's a work of art in doing that. Um, so I have a couple questions and then a couple questions pulled together from the audience. And I thought I would, you started your presentation, which I didn't know, talking about the letters between Rankin and his brother Thomas. And so as, an, and as I was listening to you read it's not just the facts. You have all facts in your book. It's a narrative, not a historical fiction. It's a narrative. But there is, you do analyze, you synthesize, you evaluate the information because that's how you're telling the story of all of those facts. And so actually one of our audience members was thinking about, did the letters between Rankin and his brother Thomas, and they were on opposite sides here, shed any light to you that you could analyze or interpret as to why Thomas felt it was okay to buy slaves. And what does that say about all of us? That we can be pulled into convincing ourselves that something is okay that is so wrong. Right. Well, first of all, the, uh, there were no more exchanges. Once, as far as I know, once Rankin sent 
started sending the letters to his brother. I don't think there were any letters uh, of apology. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, obviously the passion, when you read these letters, I reread uh, many for this uh, event, and some of them are quoted in the book. There's several pages uh, with excerpts, and as you read them, it, 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 you you really do, it's an excellent question because you really put yourself in the shoes of the brother. You think, oh my gosh, if my sister or brother sent me letters like that, uh, I would really be rethinking everything, you know. And uh, they're very powerful, which is why William Lloyd Garrison grabbed them so quickly in 1832, and they had such an impact. Uh, so I think that uh, Thomas uh, w was awakened. He was living in a culture where people weren't questioning it constantly, and uh, it was something that he was clearly proud of doing because it w showed to his brother that he was wealthy enough to buy this quote-unquote property called a slave. And so I think that's the way he saw it. And then his brother opened the door to the, um, you know, the, he, he, the oppression and what it really meant that he had done. So, yeah, powerful stuff, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, so you just said William Lloyd Garrison. So if you teach history, we teach William Lloyd Garrison with the Liberator, and we teach Harriet Beecher Stowe, we teach yeah, these people yeah. in history class, but we don't teach John Rankin, right? So I had not heard the story yeah. of John Rankin oh. before reading this book. And I had read a quote um, by Harriet Beecher Stowe saying when she was asked who abolished slavery, she said John Rankin. Right. And so why do you think this story left was left untold when it's such a rich story and some stories get picked up and others don't? Oh gosh, I mean, you know, uh, do we have two more hours? <laughs> This is, uh, maybe that should be my next book. Uh, actually, that is an excellent question. I can't answer it, you know. I mean, all I could say is that some, some stories, I mean, that is my quest. The reason I have not written that novel yet that I was researching in, uh, around Christmas in 1998 in Dayton is because every time I turn around, I find some uh, great nonfiction, I mean, true story that's in danger of falling through the cracks. And uh, it happens uh, all the time that great um, uh, heroes, uh, you know, are, uh, well, not to keep repeating it, but fall through the cracks of history. Why? Partly... Um, uh, you know, who writes about them? Who writes about them during the time when they're alive? Uh, where are the writings? Um, and who, uh, uh, which newspapers pick up their stories? Where are their obituaries? You know, at one point I really wanted to write a book that was about all these f uh, fabulous women throughout history who fell through the cracks and there are no obituaries for them. Why? I mean, really some great, very dynamic women. Um, and so that, uh, um, you know, there, there are many reasons that people uh, somehow are forgotten. And, you know, my quest has always been with narrative nonfiction is, you know, to be the conduit um, between, um, you know, mounds of information about topics and people in danger of falling through the cracks and being the conduit between that and the general reader. Because, it, you know, it has to reach the general reader. And in this day and age, you know, it's got to reach the internet. It's got to, uh, it helps if Hollywood picks it up, you know. But, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we could have a, a conversation another time. I really, ha I have a file at home of people, very dynamic people in American history who have, um, are not widely known. And um, so, that's all. Which leads me to my next question of, <laughs> of when, when you're thinking about a book like this and you're going to tell that story, and especially on a book, because you have so many books, but this book of slavery, and I know that personally you've been interested in African American history right. for a very, very long time. This was not a new passion for you coming up. But is there, like, what ethics are involved when you're writing about historical figures? Because you have to do so many things. 
at once. And then the ethics, particularly in this book, because it is involved in such a huge topic in our nation's history, such a defining moment oh, in our right. nation's history of the Underground Railroad and slavery. Right. Okay. The ethics. Um, uh, I was thinking about that when I was rereading my own book. <laughs> uh, and I found, actually, I was going to bring that up. I was going to actually include it um, uh, in the lecture, but I was afraid it would get, uh, whoops, sorry, too long. But um, there are two, uh, two topics uh, that pop up when you uh, talk about research ethics. And one is, with narrative nonfiction, it is facts, the fact checking. And uh, and the fact checking, you know, is of course major, and it's um, there are details that there are sometimes uh, leaps. Uh, between one person's action and another's, and there's no way to connect them. You can't make that up, you know, and that, that is the beauty and the challenge and the excitement of narrative nonfiction. Nothing can be made up. It has to be factual. And you, I mean, it has to be uh, true. And what I did with Beyond the River, uh, it, 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 you have to keep, um, you have to use, in journalism we call it the rule of three, but in this case, because of all the old documents, I really used a rule of two. Um, if I found, let me just read you this little thing from the notes intro of the book. If I found a story in a letter, I searched newspapers and court records for another account to validate it. For example, in his 1892 recolle recollection, Isaac Beck told the story of the murder of a free black woman, Sally Hudson. I was able to find several newspaper accounts backing up and expanding upon his account. If I found the first reference to an event in an anti-slavery newspaper, then I saw cooperation in local newspapers, in court records, in autobiographies, and letters. So uh, ethical issue number one is fact-checking. You, you owe that to your reader. And if there is a doubt then you, in the source notes, which are, you know, quite frankly, uh, quite uh, stressful for all authors. You know, you spend about six months fact-checking and putting together your source notes, but in source notes, you can explain to the reader, look, there's the possibility of X, Y, and Z. I chose X because of A, B, and C. So the two keys to ethics in the research for these, uh, this type of book are, one, the fact-checking, and two, uh, honesty with your reader. So you let them know. With Sleeper Agent, the one I just did on the Soviet spy, uh, there were three things that I could never uncover. I told the reader, you know, uh, these things seem to be impossible. You know, I seem to find these topics about people who are trying to bury what they did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, spies, uh, uh, underground railroad. It's it's not easy. So, uh, but anyhow, those are the two keys: um, the fact checking, and then being totally honest with your reader, so that they know if you didn't find something, or that there were three things, and you why you chose uh, one. So yeah. you you told me a story about sleeper agent of yeah. like something that you had to find that you couldn't quite um, put it, I think it was the picture. It was the picture of oh, someone no, from a yearbook. Oh, the description of his handler. Of, oh, the of description. Of the spy's handler. And she went to yearbooks. It was amazing. It was well, like my, I was... Well, my editor said, you, it, it, this is fine. This was the first draft, and there were four suggestions he had. And he said, we don't know what the handler looked like. And I said, it took me almost six months to find out who his handler was. <laughs> How do I know what he looked like? And he said, you have to find what he looked like. And so I think it's on page 172 of the book. Uh, I'll never forget it. It's just one paragraph, you know, it took about three months, and, and the handler was a graduate of Ohio Northern University. So, you know, it was quite an adventure. So, and I found his picture in the yearbook, yeah. So w tell us a challenge like that in this book. What was one piece of information that was just really oh, hard well, to find or something, and then you found oh it? Oh my God, yeah. 
Well, in short, uh, the biggest challenge of this book was that there was so much information to it, that I found about John Rankin, which was great, but I couldn't find a, um, a narrative, I couldn't find action. You know, you, you can't write an encyclopedia uh, account, you know, of what happened in Ripley. You have to grab the general reader, so there has to be a storyline, you know, a true story. And so the huge challenge with this book was that the uh, big uh, action in the late 1830s was the trial of John Bennington Mayhem. And in uh, the court records in Frankfort, Kentucky, I found loads of transcripts. Um, and uh, I could find uh, the uh, narrative of John Bennington Mahan uh, and that action, and I could find a lot about John Rankin, but nothing that linked John Rankin to the trial and even to John Bennington Mahan. I didn't even know if he was in John Rankin's network until one day when I was going through zillions of uh, old issues of the philanthropist newspaper, I found an ad for by John Rankin raising defense funds for the trial of John Bennington Mahan. And, you know, I mean, it was one of those moments where you're kind of embarrassed because you go, ah, really loud like in a wordle. quiet room, you know. Uh, but that was it. And, and that, that was a problem because you can't make anything up. How to, there was no, with John Rankin, there was action, you know, in terms of every year where he was, what he was doing, but there was no what we call a narrative nonfiction. There was no clothesline. There was no uh, beginning, middle, and end uh, drama. And that John Bennington Mayhem trial was quite dramatic. And so the, the a big challenge was, you know, uh, how am I going to do this? Uh, and then that day I found, uh, and then from that point on, I was able to find much uh, about, uh, because John Rankin was writing a whole lot in those issues of the philanthropist um, about the issues uh, of that trial. But that was a turning point. That was a turning point. Thank yeah. you. Um, we've also talked about uh, that history becomes personal. And so you're writing about a historic topic and you're doing things. But then there's something, and, and most of the people in this room have probably had this experience, but people who really love history, and since you're here, um, where you've like felt history. And so something has happened. And, and at one point in your book, you were writing about um, them be, uh, an abolitionist meeting in Granville. Oh. And I'm like, I've been there on Broadway. I know where that is. And so like kind of felt that, that you know, get yeah. the hair standing up and you, it, you feel history. You yeah. feel a, a connection that you hadn't before. Yeah. Um, this book of all of your books, not only because of your interest, but this is really personal. Can I give away where you live? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> She lives in Ripley. Yeah, right. I won't say yeah. more than that. Yeah. I, she lives in Ripley, but like uh, such a dedication um, to that. What was personal in this book? Like what hit you like the most? Well, from the very start, from the, from the time uh, I discovered it at the Wright Public Library, you know, and the time Alice and I had that discussion, uh, uh, over lunch, uh, I, I was grabbed by the topic, but I had chosen three different possible narratives, Madison, Indiana settings, Madison, Indiana, Marietta, or Ripley. And I went to Ripley first and spring break, 1990, when I was teaching uh, that spring semester, excuse me, and um, uh, I, I really think that, um, I, you know, Madison, Indiana, fabulous story, Marietta, fabulous story, but Ripley just, uh, as one of the pe people I first met there, it, it grabs people. It, it was a, uh, it had all the components necessary. It had uh, a character, John Rankin, who had a New York connection. He was constantly giving lectures at the anti-slavery meetings in New York. It had um, just stunning views. It had, um, and it had a fabulous 
public librarian, Allison Gibson, a fabulous uh, citizen who was, tr Betty Campbell, who was trying her hardest to teach people what was happening uh, in, um, uh, it, what had happened in Ripley and who's it contributed a tremendous amount to that town. I mean, just fabulous people. So that first place I stopped was Ripley. And it, I decided at that point I had to leave New York for a year and spend one, four seasons next to that river. Because it, on that visit, I realized that uh, the river was a character. A, you know, a character, a a character in the drama, a a force, and I had to understand it. You know, it's one thing to you know intellectually understand something, and then it's another to viscerally understand it as a writer. So I wanted to ex do four seasons there, and so I uh, temporarily uh, moved there, rented a place, and. Um, and then got uh, very attached to it, uh, and uh, and then left for a while, and then returned, and I've written three more books there, and you know, uh, my husband who's in the audience somewhere, he loves it, I love it. Uh, it it's just a very unusual place, and uh, I just feel a very. Uh, uh, close connection to it. Also, in the process of doing the research, I learned that I had relatives in Springboro, Ohio, who were part of a, another network of um, abolitionists in Ohio, and that my husband, Marley Price, his great grandfather, Michael Marley, great-great-grandfather, was part of Rankin's group. And so it, it's just sort of, it, it kept expanding. And then you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it just, uh, um, and, and I think the idea of living in a place where people were um, uh, spiritually and uh, so um, devoted, as I said, to something larger than themselves, it's really, uh, it's a timeless uh, feeling to look out over the Ohio River and remember what happened there. I mean, it's not like I live in the past all the time, but I just um, am influenced by that. And as a writer, that uh, helps me to travel to uh, whatever it is I'm writing about. Does, have, that, does that make does. sense? It does. It's perfect. I have one more question about the book that actually goes with that, yeah. um, and then maybe, <laughs> maybe the writing process if we have time. But the one about the book, you said it's been quite a while since you've read this book, right? And had to, and we're rereading this book, yeah. and so that timeless connection. Is there anything different? And uh, several audience members had questions surrounding this. Is there anything diff different now, rereading it after we've kind of had this new racial? reckoning in the right. last few years and now we're reading it and the lessons that we can take still from this story. Did you read it any differently? Um, I didn't really read it any differently, although I found two typos. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> which uh, always uh, it concerns me, but um, it's terrible to be, it's a curse and a gift to be a perfectionist, but at, at any rate, no. Uh, um, but I, I think um, putting the issue of trust into the lecture, I, I, I probably, uh, 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't have, but um, I saw in rereading it and in thinking through uh, the story again, uh, that one word, trust, you know, and I just, um, the power of that and the importance of it and the courage of it. And, uh, and so I, I think that's one thing uh, I realized. And then also, um, um, there have been many things that have popped up since I, I wrote the book. You know, one of the goals in writing a book like this is to bring other researchers in, to bring other writers in, to expand uh, what I did. And there is new information about the McKeggs, about Harriet Beecher Stowe, about John Parker, um, and uh, some wonderful people knock on my door, knock on our door in the warmer months, um, and tell stories about the things they 
know that uh, we didn't know. Uh, the local librarian, who's, uh, I call her the national treasure, anyhow, she keeps files of all kinds of new things that have come up. So to answer your question, I would really have to go through all of the new information uh, and also study uh, who the people are who bring that information, who the people are who want to continue the research, and what their approach is. What is their theme and what is their motivation in wanting to study this? You know, and, and that's where that's when we could answer that question. You know, uh, uh, but I think uh, the, that uh, social network, that network of individuals, they were all so very different. John Parker and John Rankin had different motivations. Some were deeply religious, some weren't. Uh, the women uh, were, you know, quite dynamic, and they have not, uh, talk about falling through the cracks, they have not gotten credit for some of uh, their courage. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that, that popped up um, while I was reading this, um, but at any rate, uh, we could do that in part two. In part two. <laughs> yeah. I, Sorry. I, I yeah. would look forward to that. Um, I guess I would, I would end with asking you a question about your writing process in general and, and any advice you have for aspiring narrative writers. How do you take that history and make it into this story um, that's important to be told? How do you, what advice do you have to any aspiring writers who like to research but may want to write about it? Right. Well, um, uh, the first thing I would say is read, read, read. You know, find really good writing and read it. Uh, because reading, uh, somehow there, there's some file cabinet in your subconscious and every time you read a good piece of writing, uh, you add a file to it so that when you're sitting there writing, uh, you get this sort of sense of uh, cadence, good rhythm. Um, from reading uh, writers who are really excellent. You also get a sense of the story structure. And I, I think one of the most important things, the two things I tell young writers are read, 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 uh, and st learn how to uh, uh, critique story structure. So you read a book or you go to a movie and you really like it, go back, see the movie again. Uh, read the book again and look at the components of the story and the order of things. How, you know, where, what's the beginning, middle, and end? You know, uh, how is it told? You know, it's not going to be told uh, one day George Washington was born on the first page, George Washington dies on the last page. No, it has to be a story that has a beginning, middle, and end, and, um, but the beginning could be uh, some very dramatic event that occurred uh, three quarters through that person's life. And so you begin it like that, and then go back in time, come up to that, and then go further to the end. But anyhow, studying story structure and reading uh, really good writing are my two best uh, suggestions, yeah. Do you have anything quirky about your own schedule or routine when you're in your writing? Quirky? Quirky. <laughs> I have some friends in the audience. I think they were laughing just then. <laughs> Um, uh, Do you well, eat the same breakfast? Do you? Is there anything when you're when you're in your writing mode? Is there any routine that you have to keep? Is there uh, any? Yeah. Well, I, my best writing hours are from about ten o'clock at night to about three or four in the morning. They always have been, and I, I think that you know there is a difference. In fact, for one of my college roommates, I wrote a little short story for her. 50th birthday, I think it was, about the difference between larks and owls. <laughs> um, we all lived together, and some of us were larks and some were owls. But, um, but I love those hours, because I know that everyone I love and cherish in the world is asleep, so I don't have to worry about them. <laughs> and I can just sort of go into the world that I'm writing about, and uh, that's the way it's always been, those hours. So I think that might be a little quirky. Um, I would like to change it, and I'm trying, but I've been trying for 50
50 years and it still hasn't worked. So, you have yeah. at so the only o'clock. thing is that plus, um, you know, loving coffee, I suppose. And that's I think that's the common. secret of all the good writers, yeah, right? Of, right? Of all the good writers. And I will promote your new book. So um, of, we are here for Beyond the River, but I am very excited to read your new book, um, Sleeper Agent. Oh, good. And it just won an award in the last, oh. she just found out. Oh, no, it has, it's a finalist. It's a award. finalist yeah. for an award yeah. coming up, breaking news. And um, can you just give us a really, like, the, the, the cover? What is the book about? Oh, dear. Okay, so wait. Shift from antebellum America to uh, 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 World War II America. Yeah, well, it, it is a book. Uh, it's the biography of a Soviet spy um, who, uh, he was a sleeper agent, and meaning that, you know, he came here and slipped into uh, daily life um, after being trained by the Red Army uh, in 1939. He was, uh, and he uh, uh, was drafted and uh, ended up um, working uh, at uh, because he had a science background, ended up working at the Manhattan Project and at the Oak Ridge site and also in Dayton, Ohio. Um, and uh, he was born and raised in Iowa and uh, ended up in the Soviet Union in the uh, 1930s, got an advanced degree at Mendeleev Institute, and then was recruited by the Red Army. And because he was so, uh, you know, he blended into American culture like any sleeper agent should, there was no training that was necessary for him language-wise or culture-wise activities. Um, I mean, this is a guy who loved baseball and was a skilled shortstop. You know, he could, he could run off uh, statistics for every pitcher in the history of baseball. So, uh, he, he, so he was perfect for them, and they sent him back. And they sent him to America in 1940, and then he escaped in 1948. So it's really uh, his story. Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, my and, yeah. And <laughs> you'll love every second of it. Right. Yeah. yeah Sorry, of I don't seat. know where that came from. The seat. clone. Um, <laughs> My final question, and then I'll turn yeah, it over, yeah. to, um, and I know that Anne will be signing some books and things um, coming up here, would be, uh, we had several questions from different historical um, associations and societies around about particulars of if you knew anything about their uh, section of the, of the state in the Underground Railroad. Where would you point them to start? Okay. I wasn't going to put her on the spot and say, yeah, here. Yeah, well, the, um, I wouldn't be able to give you information about specific places, I, I don't think. But I can tell you something that I realized, again, when I reread the book. And that was that uh, um, I, I, I used court records a lot. Um, I can tell you, uh, and why I did popped up while I was reading the book. In 1839, Ohio passed a fugitive slave law. And so uh, it's in here um, on page 182 and all the details of that law. But what that means in your research locally is that if you have a question about a particular house and you think it was part of uh, the network, then go to the property records, find out who owned it, uh, in those antebellum years, and then uh, go to local newspapers, see what you can find out about those, uh, the people who owned it, and also go to the court records. Because anyone involved in the state of Ohio after 1839 who was caught um, uh, you know, helping a fugitive slave would have been arrested and there would be records. And so that can really help you uh, find that, you know, because the main uh, places to look are old newspapers, court records, and property records. So, um, so I don't know if that helps or not. Yeah. Well, thank you, and I would. Um it's been such a pleasure to yeah. get to know you yeah, and, and ask questions yeah. and think about history, and it's been wonderful. And so um, thank you to Anne. Thanks. Thank you.
thank you to Ann and, and thank you to Aaron as well. Why don't we uh, give Aaron a round of applause? And then uh, one more round of applause, if you'd indulge me. We, we have a, a team, an army of hardworking and humble volunteers, historical society board members and volunteers that make tonight possible and make the future History Speaks events possible. So please share a token of your gratitude. All right, now for the mechanics of the book signing and the book purchasing. As I understand it, Anne is going to sit at the table here. So if you have a book you'd like Anne to sign, on your left, you can come up the stairs and, and line up on the stage. I also understand the cover to cover is gonna set up on your right, my left, selling books for those of you who haven't purchased them yet. So uh, we'll take the next few minutes and do that. And thank you all for attending. Thank you all for a wonderful night. <laughs>